This is a pre-course tutorial on normal distribution. In today's session, I am going to discuss about the most important and widely used continuous distribution, the normal distribution. We will begin by discussing what is a normal distribution and how to calculate the probabilities for a normal distribution. The most natural step is to ask the question, why do we want to study a normal distribution at all? So we could see how normal distribution can be used as a model to fit real life data. Next, we will move on to the concept of standard normal distribution and how it is useful. We will go forward by solving a few problems related to normal distribution. Now to identify a normal distribution, we need to understand how to identify a distribution which is not normal. To this end, we discuss the indicators for departures from normality. For various reasons, normal distribution turns out to be extremely important in statistics. Most techniques like hypothesis tests, regression, etc. are based fundamentally on the properties of normal distribution. So if you had a choice to learn more about one distribution, it would have to be normal distribution. So we will spend a bit of time trying to understand various properties of the distribution. The picture that you see here is called the probability density function of the normal distribution or PDF. You obtain this curve by plotting the x values, that is the values of the random variables on the x-axis and probability densities on the y-axis. The concept of probability density for a continuous distribution is very similar to that of relative frequency for a discrete distribution. So first, normal distribution is a continuous distribution. You need only two things to completely specify a distribution, mean and variance. You cannot have two distributions with the same mean and variance. So the moment you specify the mean and variance, you specify the normal distribution. If you look at the shape of the normal curve, it is like a bell. Thus normal distribution is called a bell-shaped curve. The characteristics of such a curve is that it is concentrated in the center and decreases on either side. This is significant in that the data has less of a tendency to produce unusually extreme values. You note that most values are concentrated around the average and very few values lie to the extreme left or right. Also, the bell curve signifies that the data is symmetrical. The normal distribution is symmetric around the mean, which is also its median and mode. Now think what happens to the distribution if you increase the mean. It shifts rightward. What happens if you increase the standard deviation but not the mean? It will just squish. A very important property of normal distribution is that the sum of two independent normal random variables is also a normal random variable. Recall that in the last module we had spoken about the sum of two independent random variables and how to deduce the mean and variance of the sum of the two independent random variables. In the same way, you can find the mean and variance of the sum of the two independent normal random variables and due to the above property, be rest assured that the new variable will also follow normal distribution. We move on to our next learning goal, that is, how to compute probabilities for a normal distribution. Now the key question is, how do you compute probabilities for a normal distribution given its probability density curve? The fundamental difference between probability computation for discrete and continuous distributions is that the probability of obtaining a certain specific value is not meaningful for the latter. It is more meaningful to specify ranges of values. To understand this, let capital X be the random variable denoting birth weight of newborn babies where capital X follows a normal distribution with a mean of 3.39 and standard deviation of 0.55 kgs. 
Now what is the probability that the birth weight of a certain baby is 4.3472778 kgs? Is it not one possibility among an infinite number of possibilities? It is like asking for the probability of catching a particular raindrop. But could you answer if the question is reframed as what is the probability that the birth weight of a certain baby is between 4 to 5 kgs which includes the number 4.3472784 kgs? Pictorially, that is given by the area under the probability density function within that range x1 is equal to 4 and x2 is equal to 5 in this case. Since one of the values will surely happen, the area under the entire curve will be 1. I want to spend the next few minutes doing some probability calculations for normal distribution. Conceptually, as we have seen in the last slide, the probability of x lying in a particular interval is given by the area enclosed by that interval in the probability density curve. How do you compute this area? So you can calculate the probability in two ways. Excel has built-in functions that make things rather easy. This is most likely what you will use for your work. However, to get more intuition, just like you don't learn addition on a calculator, we will use what are called Z tables and standard normal distribution. We come to one of the most important steps for doing any probability calculation for a normal distribution, which is the concept of standard normal distribution. So what is a standard normal distribution? The idea is really that of standardization, that is, converting any given normal distribution into one that has a mean of zero and a standard deviation of one. For every value of the random variable, there is a corresponding value in the standard normal distribution which we call as the z-value or z-score. If you look at the expression for a z-value, it is basically telling you how many standard deviations away is your value from the mean and on which side. So then you will have positive z-values on the right side, negative z-values on the left side. Once you get the z-value, you can go to the z-table and look up the corresponding probability. The best part is making the transformation doesn't affect your probability. If you look at the diagram above, z1 corresponds to the same relative position in the standard normal curve as x1 in the original normal curve. This has the implication that the probability of x lying in a particular interval for the original normal curve is the same as the standard normal variable lying in the transformed interval in the standard normal curve. The red marked regions in both the diagrams denote the required probabilities. As we will walk through some more examples in the next few slides, this point will become clear. If you think about it, it's really a nice trick. If you did not have this conversion, you would have required a separate table for every possible normal distribution. And how many different normal distributions are possible? In finite, as you might have guessed, for every single change in any of the parameter values, your normal distribution will also change. You will need infinite number of tables and that is a really daunting prospect. Thanks to the standard normal distribution, and the property that every possible normal distribution can be converted into the former, you only need to look up the standard normal table. The natural step is now to read the standard normal table. The above table is lifted from your textbook. From the table, what is the probability that Z is less than or equal to 1.1? You read the 12th row and 3rd column to find the red circle value 0.8643 which is the required probability. Similarly you can compute probability z less than or equal to minus 1.1 or probability modulus z greater than or equal to 1.1 or probability modulus z less than or equal to 1.1 directly from the standard normal table. 
what if you are asked to find the area to the right of the standard normal variable say probability z is greater than or equal to 1.1 since probability z greater than or equal to 1.1 is nothing but 1 minus probability capital z is less than small z you can simply subtract 0.8643 from 1 and get the required probability as 0.1357 Next, we will discuss how normal distribution can be applied in solving real-life problems, that is, the application of normal distribution as a model for fitting real-life data. This histogram is produced from data related to the weights of newborn babies. Superimposing a normal curve with mean of 3.39 and standard deviation of 0.55 we see that the histogram approximately follows the shape of the normal curve. This serves as an indicator that this data on the birth weights of newborn babies can be approximated by a normal distribution. Now what do we mean by approximation by a normal distribution? It means given a real life data, we fit a normal distribution to the data to calculate probabilities of various events based on that data. But how do you know which data can be approximated by the normal distribution? We discuss the goodness of approximation later on towards the presentation. The bigger question of course is how is normal distribution practically is useful and why this obsession with understanding whether a data can be approximated by a normal distribution or not. Normal distribution is in general a very useful and widely used distribution. To state a few, height and intelligence are approximately normally distributed. Measurement errors also often have a normal distribution. Also, the normal distribution is easy to work with mathematically. As you have seen, probabilities for normal distribution can be easily computed. We now come to the part all of you had been waiting for, that is, how to solve problems using a normal distribution. I think we now come to the part all of you had been waiting for, that is, how to solve problems using a normal distribution. Let's get a hang of this by going through some calculations ourselves. Suppose GMAT scores can be reasonably modeled using a normal distribution with mean 638 and sigma 66. We superimpose such a normal curve on the histogram of the GMAT scores data which we drew in the tutorial on probability and random variables. We see that it is not very different from the histogram that we had created using the raw data. Now, using the fact that the GMAT scores data is normally distributed, what is probability x less than or equal to 600? The first step is to convert the normal random variable capital X into the corresponding Z value. Here Z is equal to 600 minus 638 divided by 66 which is minus 0 0.58. We are not going to be afraid of negative Z values. You just need to go to the Z table at the back of the book the snapshot of which was given in the previous slide. You have the value corresponding to minus 0 0.6. You can take that value as the approximate probability, that is, the required probability will be 0.2743. We play around with this GMAT score data and compute a few more probabilities to make sure that you understand the methods for probability calculations. Now, what is the probability that the scores of GMAT students lie between 605 and 704. Like before, we first transform the values taken by x into standard normal values so that 704 corresponds to 1 and 605 corresponds to minus 0 0.5. For computing the probability that x lies between minus 0 0.5 to 1, we first find the probability of capital X lying to the left of 1 which we show in the first figure. Next, we find the probability of x lying to the left of minus 0 0.5 which is shown in figure 2. Finally, 
to compute the probability of x lying in the required interval, we subtract the value of the probability obtained from the second calculation from that obtained from the first which comes to 0 0.5328. Till now, we were solving problems where given particular values of the normal random variable, we obtain the corresponding values of the standard normal variable and use the z values to compute the required probabilities. Now let me ask you a question. Can we flip our problem? In other words, can we compute the z values given the probability values? Look at the given problem. The amount of fuel consumed by the engines of a jetliner on a flight between two cities is a normally distributed random variable x with mean of 5.7 tons and a standard deviation of 0.5 tons. Carrying too much fuel is inefficient as it slows the plane. If however, too little fuel is loaded on the plane, an emergency landing may be necessary. The airline would like to determine the amount of fuel to load so that there would be a 0.99 probability that the plane will arrive at its destination. So we need to find a z-value such that the area lying to the left of that particular z-value is 0 0.99. If you look at the probabilities in the standard normal table from your textbook, the z-value corresponding to 0 0.98 280 is 2.30 that is probability that the standard normal variable is less than 2.3 is 0 0.989280. The next step is to transform the z value that we get into the normal random variable corresponding to a mean of 5.7 and a standard deviation of 0 0.5 tons. Note that this is the reverse of the transformation that we have been doing till now, converting normal random variables to standard normal variables. After transformation, we obtain our x value as 6.865, which is the required amount of fuel to be loaded in the plane, so that there is a 99% probability that the fuel will last throughout the flight. We consider another problem. I leave a few hints to understand this problem. The first step is to convert the stated problem into a mathematical expression. Since the packaging label states the weight as 16 ounces, any box weighing less than 16 ounces will be considered underweight. The problem asks us to compute the mean of the process so that mu is unknown here. We know that x follows a normal distribution with a mean of mu and a standard deviation of 0 0.2. Using this information, we convert x into the standard normal variable, which is 16 minus mu divided by 0 0.2. We need to find the value of mu such that the probability that z is less than 16 minus mu divided by 0 0.2 is 0 0.005. Looking at the standard normal table, we see that the z value such that the area to the left of that z value is 0 0.005 is minus 2.578. According to the problem, this value is equal to 16 minus mu by 0 0.2. From this equality, we compute the required value of mu as 16.52. Lastly, we look at how to identify whether an actual data can be approximated by a normal distribution or not. Now that we have understood the methods for computing normal probabilities, we ask an important question. How do we make use of these probabilities? How can we model real life data using normal distribution? Many real life data can be approximated using the normal distribution. However, before modeling any data with normal distribution, it is important to check if the data is approximately normal or not. While discussing the fitting of normal distribution to real life data, I had mentioned that the goodness of fit will be discussed later. 
Here we go now. You can obviously have skewed distributions. Median is less than or more than the mean. You can have more than one mode which might denote a mixture distribution. In terms of actually quantifying it, you can look at skewness and kurtosis. These are zero for normal distribution and further the numbers are from zero, less likely is the distribution to be normal. You can plot the histogram of the real life data. If it resembles a bell shape, it indicates that the data might come from a normal distribution. There is another graphical way rather than just inspecting the histogram, which is called a normal quantile plot. The normal quantile plot is obtained by plotting theoretical quantiles of the standard normal distribution on the x-axis and the corresponding quantiles obtained from the real-life data you have in hand, that is, the sample quantiles computed from your data set on the y-axis. Now we know the relation between any normal variable and its corresponding standard normal variable. It is z is equal to x minus mu by sigma or x is equal to mu plus z sigma. If the data comes from a normal distribution with mean mu and standard deviation sigma, then the quantiles computed from your data should be related to the quantiles of the standard normal variable in the same linear fashion, that is, quantile of data is equal to mu plus sigma quantile of standard normal variable. So if your data really comes from a normal distribution with mean mu and standard deviation sigma, then the quantiles computed from the data should approximately lie on the straight line. Two bands, called the 95% confident bands, can be computed around the straight line. If most of the points lie within these bands, then we may say that the data can be approximated by a normal distribution. What we are looking for really are points beyond the bands of tolerance. If too many points lie outside the bands, it indicates that normal distribution may not be appropriate for modeling this data. Remember that all these tests we spoke about for testing, whether the data comes from normal distribution or not, are not strict. They should be used as mere indicators for getting an intuitive sense of whether you can model your data using normal distribution or not. Thank you. I hope all of you enjoyed this session with us.